Welcome everyone. My name is Dottie Schindlinger and I'm the executive director of the Diligent Institute and Diligent is the parent company of Board Effect. I was one of the founding team members of Board Effect and so I'm quite delighted to be here with you today representing Board Effect and being part of this incredible conference. I, I hope some of you got an opportunity to see the panel session that I did yesterday on purpose-driven leadership and it was really just such a terrific conversation. I think the sessions at this conference have been so impactful and I am really excited excited to have the opportunity to give you this information and have a chance to co-present with my two amazing panelists today. Um, so let's kind of get started here. I'm going to just start really briefly with some housekeeping and some introductions. So just to remind everyone, if you didn't have a chance to hear me say this earlier, all of the audio and video are going to be muted for the sake of this session, just for the sake of the recording. But we would love to hear from you. So please put any questions you have in the chat box, and we'll be addressing those as we go through today's session. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by my two dear friends and colleagues and compadres, pick another great word for people that you rely on for so many different reasons. Um, I'm joined by Deirdre Webster Cobb, who is the chair and CEO of the New Jersey Civil Service Commission. She also serves as the board chair for the Alice Paul Institute. Deirdre, welcome. Oh, I think you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, forgot about that. Um, thank you for inviting me to participate today, Dottie. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. And then we're also joined by our new executive director for Alice Paul Institute, Allison Titman. Allison, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Dottie. Excited to be here today. So what we're going to be covering today is um, our story. <laughs> we're going to keep it simple. We're just going to tell you our story. Uh, Alice Paul Institute had a really interesting 2020 uh, because right at the beginning of June, we learned from our incumbent executive director at the time, Lucy Beard, someone who had been with the organization for close to 30 years in a variety of different roles that she had decided she would retire by the end of 2020. Um, it was something that we knew was likely to happen. We just didn't know it was going to happen in five and a half months. And so we knew that we had to, uh, you know, start the search right away and find our next executive director. But we were in the middle of a pandemic. And so having on-site interviews, gathering in person for committee meetings, all of those things were basically off the table. And so what we wanna to do today is share with you the story of how we did this. And most especially, we wanna share with you some of the lessons we learned about the process of executive search and onboarding that I think are gonna resonate with you and would be, I would think best practices, regardless of whether or not you can gather in person or have to do everything remotely. Um, so I want to get started, though, by just sharing with you a little bit of background. And I also want to tell you that we've written a white paper for today. Um, this is something that we will send out to each of you as a follow up to this webinar. So don't worry about, you know, trying to scramble and find a link. We, we're going to just email it to you as soon as the webinar is over. And the white paper gives you a lot of detail about our process. So don't feel like you have to take, you know, pages of notes today. We've basically written a whole white paper for you that explains the process in great detail. And we hope that it's helpful to you. And if it is helpful to you, let us know that. We'd love to hear back from you whether any part of of this story resonates for you and is helpful to your organization. Um, so just to kind of get started, though, I think it'd be helpful if we share a little bit of background about the Alice Paul Institute. It's helpful to understand the context. And so, Allison, I wonder if you could share with us a bit about API. Patty knows I love any excuse to talk about gender equality and suffrage history. So for anyone who doesn't know or who's had a while since our high school history class, Alice Paul was one of the crusaders for women's suffrage in the United States. She was born and raised in New Jersey, educated in Quaker schools, including Swarthmore College, and initially thought she was going to go into social work and education. She went to England to pursue those goals and there became part of the suffrage movement led by the Pankhurst. This was a fairly radical suffrage movement. The news coverage about them was about the tactics they used, including interrupting political speech or speeches, throwing rocks through windows, and chaining themselves to the fences of government buildings. When Alice Paul returned to England, she got involved in the movement for suffrage equality here. 
most people know that she organized the 1913 suffrage march in Washington, D.C. the day before Wilson's inauguration and went on to pressure Wilson and our legislature until the 19th Amendment was passed in 1920. She went on to write the Equal Rights Amendment and to spend the rest of her life, which ended in 1977, advocating for its passage. Next slide, Daddy. Thanks. So the Alice Paul Institute was founded to celebrate the centennial of Alice Paul's birth in the mid 1980s. We are headquartered at Paulsdale, Alice Paul's birthplace and childhood home. And we spend our time creating the next generations of Alice Pauls. We do leadership development programming specifically for girls and young women. And we also, in non-pandemic times, welcome visitors to Paulsdale to learn more about Alice and her legacy. As I said, one of our major areas of focus is leadership development programming. This picture is of the girls in our flagship program, the Girls Leadership Council, which meets monthly during the school year to discuss topics relevant to girls and women in the United States and around the world. We teach them how to do advocacy and then give them opportunities to do so. So this group is standing in Washington, DC, where they were meeting with their congressional representatives to talk about the Equal Rights Amendment and why those representatives should continue to push for its passage. Later this year, hopefully at the end of August, we look forward to resuming on-site programming where we'll welcome school groups, families, adults, children, members of the general public to Paulsdale for our curriculum-based programming, for tours, and just to experience the atmosphere and the story that turned Alice Paul into this leader and crusader for equality. We are also going to continue the virtual programming we've been doing during the pandemic. I would encourage you to go to our website, alicepaul.org and look at our calendar. We have been excited about the opportunity that virtual programming has presented to reach people across the country and across the world with our programs on women's history and how that history relates to what's happening today. We talk a lot about civic engagement. We wanna create educated citizens who advocate for what they believe in and are knowledgeable about what's happening in today's world. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, a great example of a purpose-driven leader <laughs> is, is Allison Tittman, so thank you so much. Um, I want to now shift the focus back in time. Um, you'll, you'll pardon us, Allison, we're going to tell a story before you came on board, so um, we're going to bring you into the story when we get to the part where you started to come and meet with us. But I want to go and first ask Deirdre to share with us a little bit of background about the process that we engaged in. Um, these are some questions that we'll be discussing as we go. And I'm going to actually um, turn the screen off for a bit because we're going to just be talking for a moment here. But I want to start out, Deirdre. Um, you had asked me to be the chair of the search committee. Let's go back in time. When you first got the news from Lucy that she was planning to retire at the end of the year, how did you make the decision that we needed to have a search committee and also a separate transition committee? And how did you decide who needed to be on those committees? Well, um... Lucy had come to me in June of 2020. I had only been board chair for maybe two and a half months. So I said, I hope this isn't personal <laughs> that she had announced that she was retiring. And of course it was, it was not because she um, um, was the one who actually recommended that I take over um, the role as board chair. But I, um, it really um, put me in a very precarious situation because here we had an individual who had been with API for almost 30 years and has served in just about every um, capacity that you could share um, in the organization. So I knew immediately that it was going to be um, hard to find someone with the knowledge and skills um, set that we needed um, to run the organization post Lucy. Um, and then we also had a very short time frame because she told me she was going to be leaving at some point in December. She said she did have some flexibility, but to the extent possible, she, you know, asked that we try to um, find her replacement um, by the end of the year. So that really just gave me about five and a half months to um, get things going 
And I knew that it was going to be difficult because we were in the midst of a pandemic. So who do I immediately think of um, to chair? But um, Dottie, because first of all, she was the vice chair. She had been um, around for many, many years and in fact was in line to be the um, board chair before um, you know, they asked me to do it because, for personal reasons. And um, also just because of the um, background and, and knowledge that um, she had and very, you talk about a purpose-driven um, leader, Dottie is very purpose-driven. So I knew that if um, anyone could um, take on this um, role and be able to expedite the process, it would be Dottie. But I also was very concerned about making sure that we had diversity on the committee. And I'm not talking about diversity in terms of um, race or gender. I'm talking about diversity in terms of the knowledge of API, um, the um, organizational um, structure, our strategic um, plan, um, our programming, our, our budget, so I decided to um, tap into um, four other individuals. One was the immediate past chair, one was our treasurer, and one was the chair of the strategic planning committee. And then I wanted to make sure that we had a perspective of um, our mothers or parents who um, are the um, caretakers of our girls leadership council. So um, members, so I asked another board member who basically represents the interests of the um, parents and the girls leadership council to serve in that capacity. And um, she also happened to be a minority and I wanted to make sure we had you know, that perspective as well. So we um, moved um, very quickly. You know, I had to make sure that those individuals had the time to commit to the process because I knew we would probably be meeting on a weekly basis. Um, and you know, even though it was a pandemic, people still have jobs and um, needed to make sure that they would be committed to the process. So fortunately, um, all of the individuals I um, tapped into um, said that they would serve in the capacity, they understood the importance of um, our moving ahead quickly and also the importance of, the, of our being able to find um, the right person for, for the job. Um, in addition to the search committee, I really had to start thinking about transition. Again, it was a very short period of time. We needed to make sure that we had everything in place for a smooth transition from the outgoing executive director to the in incoming executive director. So we wanted to look at our infrastructure, um, our um, archives, um, our um, management, our day-to-day -day management, personnel, budget, um, the strategic planning process. So we wanted to make sure that we had all of our operational um, procedures and policies in place so that when we onboarded the new executive director, it would be um, a, a smooth transition. And um, for, for that, I um, decided to, of course, utilize the current executive director as well as the operations manager because they are so intimately involved in the running of the day-to-day -day operations of um, API. And then I um, again requested that the immediate past chair um, serve and then the um, um, chair of the strategic planning committee, I asked that she also serve um, because of their role and their um, intimate knowledge of API um, the history and where we plan to go in the future. So then I needed a chair and I didn't have a clue as to who I could ask to serve in that capacity. So the recommendation actually came from the executive director 
and she has suggested one of our board members, Mary Sal. And she suggested Mary because of her background in um, corporate America and the fact that she had um, been involved in various types of transitions over um, her years um, as a um, corporate executive. And um, she was retired and she had the time um, to be able to devote um, to the um, transition process. That's terrific. So a couple of key learnings there that I think are, are very helpful for folks to know. One is that we had a separate committee just focused on the search and a separate committee just focused on the transition, but there were actually two members of, of the committees that overlapped. So there were two people on the search committee that also served on the transition committee. And that I think made everything just so much more smooth. Um, yeah. we, we really had you know one job to do each and we each could focus on that job, but we had that overlap. So people kind of had that continuity, which I think was yes. extremely important. Yeah, great. Thank you, Deirdre. That's such a great description. Um, so I'm gonna pick up the story from here and then I'll bring in Allison. So um, I've been asked to chair this committee <laughs> and we have five months to find a new executive director to replace someone who's been there for 30 years in a pandemic. So um, no stress, no pressure. Uh, what we decided to do first was figure out our process. And I, ha I had just by a sheer dumb luck had the great opportunity to be involved in a program. Um, I give presentations on behalf of the work I do pretty much all year long. And I was giving a presentation to a group of board members in Colorado. And we were talking about what governance was like during the pandemic. We were talking about virtual governance and how you know different that was and, and all the different challenges associated with it. And I just happened to ask, is anyone going through the process of hiring a new CEO during this pandemic? Because I'd love to know what that's like. We're trying to do that for the board that I serve on. How are you doing it? And it just so happened that a woman by the name of Shannon Sisler, who is the chief people officer at Crocs, was on that call. And she also had just headed up the search committee for the Girl Scouts of Colorado, and they hired their new executive director in the middle of the pandemic. So it could not have been better. She, here she is, a, a consummate professional in HR who's just gone through this process for another organization that serves women and girls. I mean, it was like literally kismet. It was incredible. And so she um, offered to have a call with me. And in the course of about 45 minutes, she laid out this process that was just so incredible. And we took that process and had our very first committee meeting. Um, I had, you know, quickly written up a paper based on what she told me and shared that with the committee. And we decided we wanted to follow the process, but adapt it for our specific needs. So just to really quickly kind of outline the process, um, we started out by doing a complete needs assessment. And again, I'll just, I'll just remind you, this is all written up in the white paper that we're going to be sending to you after this webinar. So don't feel you have to, you know, stress yourself out trying to take notes. It's all in the white paper. But basically, you start out by doing a very thorough needs assessment. And for Alice Paul Institute, you know, as you heard from Allison, we have kind of a four-part mission. And so it's uh, really a three-part plus more <laughs> mission. It's history. It's all about um, training the next generation of leaders, and it's all about gender equality. And you know those three things all hang together, but are kind of unique and different. And so trying to figure out where, which direction do we go to look for our next leader? Do we tap into the history community and find someone who's got that um, background in working with a historic property and a museum? Do we look for someone who's got a strong advocacy background? You know, someone who maybe knows about um, you know, putting together programs that fight for social change? Or do we look for someone who maybe is stronger on the program side um, or, or even on the, um, you know, political side, it, there were a lot of questions. <laughs> we weren't quite sure what direction to go. And we felt the very first thing we needed to do was hear from our community. So we started out by issuing a survey um, and we used SurveyMonkey to do this. And the other thing I will say early, or early on in this process that was so incredibly important was that we figured out what tools we were gonna be using. Again, we're working in the middle of a pandemic. Everything is gonna to have to happen online. And so for us, we used a, a blend of different tools, but every single tool connected back to our secure board platform. Uh, we happen to use BoardEffect, probably doesn't surprise you given my history with BoardEffect, um, but 
everything connected through board effect. And so what that meant was anytime we wanted to have a committee discussion, we had a place to do that in board effect. Anytime we had documentation to post for each other to review, that all went into our committee workroom in board effect. Um, anytime that we needed to provide access to the recordings of interviews or candidate resumes or any of the rating sheets that we were all filling out as we scored the interviews, everything went into board effect. And that served two purposes for us. One was it allowed the committee to be really flexible. There were a lot of meetings. It is hard to over overemphasize how many meetings we had. The committee itself was meeting every single week, but throughout the course of this um, process, we conducted over 25 interviews. And so, you know, having all six of the, all five of the committee members attend all 26 of the interviews wasn't necessarily going to work. So we had to have a way that we could have as many of the committee members together as possible. Um, but take notes and capture the recording so that if someone wanted to come back and view it later, they could. So part one was just a central repository that was very well organized and was kept absolutely rigorously up to date. I mean, the moment something was over, it got posted. But the second thing that was extremely important to us was security. You know, one of the things during a search is you get a lot of resumes from candidates who have current jobs. And for a leadership position, it's extremely sensitive information that they are even considering applying. You don't want their name to be leaked. You don't want the fact that they're applying to get out there. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, if you're using email all the time for communication, there's a greater, really an exponentially greater likelihood that something is going to get leaked by accident. And I don't mean the candidates sending in their resumes. I'm really talking more about the committee talking back and forth about the interviews or about the merits of specific candidates or questions that they'd like to ask in the next interview. That is all such sensitive information. So for us, Board Effect became the place where everything that it was in any way sensitive got posted, and that was the only place it lived. And then when we wanted to alert each other that something was there, we used the discussion system in Board Effect to just alert the committee, please go into Board Effect and read this. And that just eliminated a lot of the concern. We didn't have to be so super concerned about the security at that point because everything was in one place. Um, so that's something to just sort of mention. The other thing I will say then about this process is that we engaged our stakeholders in a number of different ways. We did a, a survey of our stakeholder community using SurveyMonkey and collected all that data in time for our board retreat, which was coming up at the end of July. But then we also really wanted to spend some time with a group of stakeholders that represented the cross-section of different kinds of voices that we serve as an organization. So we conducted about 11 interviews. Um, and what was really amazing, we thought, how are we ever going to get through all of this? You know, we formed the committee and our first meeting was on June 22nd. Our board retreat was on July 30th. We're in a pandemic. We can't pull people together. How in the world are we going to interview 11 people and gather this information and do a full survey and get this all ready for July 30th? But you know, the thing was, we were able to do it just virtually because everybody was available. When we called people to say, could you just take 20 minutes with us? Pretty much everyone said yes. You know, we're in a pandemic. People weren't going anywhere. So we had this kind of interesting, um, I think maybe almost benefit of the fact that everybody was under shutdown orders and that they were available. And then for the committee, we were able to make it um, so much easier by just scheduling things. We used Calendly to let people pick a time that worked for them. And then we just scheduled the times that we knew the committee members were available and let the people that we were interviewing just pick a time off of Calendly. And that helped to keep everything organized. Then the other thing that I would say that was incredibly important to us early on is we went to the board and we asked for um, approval of a budget expenditure that obviously we hadn't planned at the beginning of the fiscal year to hire a search consultant. For us, we felt that a lot of the legwork could be done by the committee, and we felt like the committee had sort of the, the knowledge and the time to be able to do it. But there were certain things that we had questions about, and there were certain parts of the process that we really knew it would be beneficial both to the candidates, to the committee, committee and to the process if we had an expert come in from the outside. So we hired a search consultant named Sonia Stam. 
She's an individual consultant with a practice called the STAM Consultancy here in the Philadelphia region. And she had worked in the past with the Alice Paul Institute on other projects. So she knew the organization. She also knew the market. She does executive search for a lot of nonprofits in our region. And she also knows the space. She's worked with many other gender equality organizations and women's groups. And she's also worked with a lot of history organizations. So she was a really good choice for us. Um, and really, we had her deployed in a couple of very specific strategic ways. We had her help us create the job uh, posting. So we had our full job description and she helped us turn that into an ad to get the right things. She also helped us to create the rubric that we used for scoring the interviews. So when we would do the candidate interviews, we used this very standardized instrument so we could all kind of compare and contrast scores of each candidate's performance. And then finally, she did all of the initial screenings and she conducted the reference checks and sort of helped us at the end in terms of giving us some guidance around the offer. Um, so those things were extremely helpful to us. Having her screen the candidates, um, give us that kind of guidance and assistance was extremely, extremely helpful. And the other thing I would say is, you know, we received over 100 applications for the role. So having someone do the screening who wasn't a volunteer with a full-time day job was a plus. <laughs> so I would say those, those are a couple of things that, um, that I would throw out there as considerations. So now I want to fast forward and bring Allison into the conversation because I think it'd be really great, Allison, to have you talk about the experiences that we um, put you through <laughs> or asked you to go through. If you would kind of talk about how we structured that part of the process and what was that like from your perspective? So I think it's important to note that I was not job hunting. I saw this posting um, and read it and, and had a little bit of an internal struggle because job hunting during the pandemic, going through an interview process for an executive leadership position did not sound like it would be a good time, but the job was too perfect. If I had written my dream job description, this would have been it. So I couldn't not apply. I submitted my materials and was really happy to receive a reply back from Sonia Stam. I had met her through another executive search, so she was familiar not just with my resume, but with who I was as a candidate and a person and understood off the bat why I was so interested in this job. So that part of the process, uh, despite being during the pandemic with all of its stresses, felt easier. Then I uh, was moved forward and received an epic document from Dottie, which again helped to ease the bit of stress about working through this process. It laid out everything so clearly. It laid out what meetings I should expect to have, who they would be with. It even gave me many bios of the participants, and it laid out the expectations for me. So it told me that I was going to meet with the executive director on site um, so that I could see the site and get to meet her and ask her questions about the organization, as well as having her ask me questions. And then it told me very clearly that I should expect to not just attend, but lead virtual meetings with the staff and a group of stakeholders, as well as to participate in meetings with the search committee and eventually the full board where they would ask questions about my qualifications. So I think it was helpful to know from the beginning what the process looked like, especially since the process was extended over something like five weeks because of the number of meetings and because they were virtual. I had been through more traditional executive leadership search processes where they culminate in an on-site day long or even two day interview where you're rushed from meeting to meeting, you don't have time to remember names, you never have enough food or water and you're left entirely spent at the end of the process. So this was actually a nice change from that. I could plan my time, I could think between meetings about how I wanted to position myself and what ideas I wanted to communicate next time. But it was challenging. I was working full time, sometimes at the office, but often from home. So I'd work a full day, then brush my hair, throw on a blazer and hop on Zoom with the engaged team from the Alice Paul Institute. It turned out to be fortuitous that we were doing the process this way. I had a really intense family situation that actually necessitated me asking Dottie if we could move a meeting or two because of what was going on in my life. And because it was virtual and because as Dottie noted, people were more available, 
the team was very nicely able to accommodate my needs and it didn't set the process back. So for all of those reasons, I ended up being very grateful that we were working in this virtual way, even though I don't recommend necessarily having to work through an executive search during intense pandemic conditions. I think that, I think that's uh, everybody would agree with that, Allison. But but I do agree with you. Um, you know, having this flexibility, I think, was really important. Deirdre, I I want to ask you to reflect on this process too, because so many of the things that Allison just touched on were strategic decisions that we made as we were thinking through the process. Things like, um, you know, which stakeholders to have the candidates meet with as part of the roundtables. Um, things like how much prep to give the candidates. You know, how I I, I told the candidates as much as I felt was reasonable, but it was more than probably would have been shared in a traditional search process. So maybe share some of your reflections on a little bit of that process. Well, one thing that I really valued was that um, we really took the time um, to listen to each other and um, what um, each, each of the um, committee members um, with different perspectives were with respect to how the um, process should be um, rolled out. And we were very good at building consensus. Um, there really wasn't like any um, dissension. There wasn't um, any um, um, opposition to the approach that we were taking. It, it really was a good fit as a team. We worked very well as a team um, all focused on the end goal. And fortunately, we all had the same mindset. Um, so I really um, thought that that allowed us to um, work in an expeditious manner. We didn't have to take the time to address um, issues, um, or e either personality issues or um, issues with respect to um, philosophy or approach. Um, so um, I thought, I think that's one thing that I, I really value. Um, the other thing is that um, it was in a, a virtual um, environment, which did give us a lot of flexibility. I, I really don't think that we would have been able to um, expedite this process if we had an in-person process. So I, in this case, there was value in, in being able to do this virtually, because under normal circumstances, if there hadn't been a pandemic, um, I don't think that it would have been, it would have been in person. And I think that that would have really impacted um, the process. And I think it also would have impacted the um, individuals um, who were ultimately chosen to move forward. Um, Cause we had people from all over, you know, applying um, for this um, position. And um, because it was virtual, um, we were able to easily schedule people for the interviews and for the different um, sessions with our stakeholders and ultimately with our um, staff and with our board. And if we had to do that in person, we would have been here till next year <laughs> trying to um, get everybody and um, you know, have the opportunity to um, meet with all those um, stakeholders. I think that's really true, yeah. Um, I do wanna just reflect on one thing that you said, which is, you're right. I think the committee did a great job of building consensus, but that's not to say that we always agreed. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, as we went through the interviews, you know, I think there was quite a range of opinions on different candidates. And so it was, um, you know, it was great to be able to talk those things through. And, and again, I think that served as um, one of the most important reasons why meeting every single week for an hour became just, um, it, it just became a regular pulse check for us. And quite honestly, I, I've heard from members of the committee, and I know Deirdre, you and I have talked about it, that we actually all kind of miss each other now. <laughs> we, all, we all sort of miss that every Monday from four to five meeting that we had, you know, starting in June and going all the way through to, um, you know, towards the end of December. Um, but it just gave us that opportunity to kind of check in. There's a great question in the chat. So thank you, those of you who are asking questions. Um, one question was about, you know, where do you find compensation information? And of course, that was one of the things that we all wanted to know the answer to right away. Um, as an organization, you know, having had someone in the executive director position for a long time, you know, 
sometimes that salary isn't quite where it needs to be in order to really have the role be attractive to the kind of candidate that you're seeking. And so we right away reached out to our um, state's nonprofit association in, in New Jersey. It's called the Center for Nonprofits. And they do, I think it's every year, or maybe every other year, a really comprehensive um, compensation and benefits survey. I mean, it's really detailed. And so that was great. I, I think it cost us maybe like 90 bucks to buy a copy uh, worth every penny because it gives you, you know, really granular level of detail for organizations of this type of this size and these zip codes, you know, here's what you can kind of expect. And here's what it looks like. It's almost like when you're trying to sell your house and you're looking for comps, it's like that is, you know, what are all the, what, what does it look like across your region? Um, and then what does it look like nationally? And they have all that information in that survey. So I I would, I would recommend that as a strategy. And then the other question that just came up in the chat that I'd love to ask Deirdre your thoughts about, um, and it's funny, I don't think we ever talked about whether or not to have an interim ED, given how long our ED had been in the role, but- It we, did come up. Um, yeah, it, I think it, we rejected it, it pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, it did come up and it might've been um, with the governance committee. And, and that's something I guess we should mention that um, you know they also, played a role in this because they were the ones who had to put together that job description. And they um, had started working on that relatively early, almost immediately after the executive director gave her notice. But um, we did um, talk about having an interim um, executive director and we pretty quickly mixed that idea because we knew that this process was gonna be very um, intense and it was going to take a lot of time. So we didn't want to have to do this again in a year or three years. We wanted to make sure that when we selected a person, the person, that the person would be someone who we would be able to keep in this capacity for a, a significant period of time. Not quite 30 years, maybe, but. <laughs> Re you really, know, just but, until both Deirdre and I rotate off the board, Allison, that's all we're saying. <laughs> but, we, but we were pretty adamant about making sure that we would be able to identify someone who would be able to stay in this role for, you know, um, years to come. I think it also might be helpful if we talk, you know, really, really briefly, or at least a little bit about some of the context of why why we were kind of able to do this so quickly. Um, I feel it's partly because Deirdre, our board has been on quite a journey. We've been having some really, um you know, challenging conversations at the board level. We've been talking about, you know, the intersectionality of racism and sexism. We've been talking about gender and gender fluidity. I mean, yeah. these are not easy kind of you know, what's the budget look like type of conversations. Right. And we've been having those over the course of the last, you know, really the last two years, especially. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing that's kind of in the background before this search started? So, you know, we have um, our Girls Leadership Council and I'll, I'll start there is because they kind of keep us current. You know, they're young, their ideas and their perspectives are very different than our board members who are a little older. And, um, you know, they have a different look, um, a different take on feminism and what that entails and who's included. So um, as a result of that, we really started looking at what the future of feminism is. And we had to look at it through the lens of the people who we know are, we're grooming to, carry on, you know, to carry the torch into the future. So um, we've been going through um, our, looking at our strategic um, plan and um, seeing if it needed to be adjusted to reflect um, the way um, young people think today. Um, and we also um, had to bring that to the attention of our stakeholders. So when we were going, starting to go through this process and engaging them, we wanted to know what did they think about those issues and what did they think about the direction um, the Alice Paul Institute um, needed to go. So as we were going through the search process, a lot of the information that we um, gained from our, our stakeholders, um, you know, our donors, our um, staff, um, our board members, our girls' leadership um, council members, 
those were all, that was very valuable information that we've been able to continue to um, use and consider as we move forward with our strategic plan. That's, that's very, very helpful. Um, Allison, I wanna also turn back over to you because as you've been kind of coming into the organization and working so closely with the girls, do you maybe wanna give a little bit more context on what our Girls Leadership Council is really like, you know, some of the things that they are talking about in the program that they do? Because I think that's that's helpful to sort of understand, um, you know, Deirdre's Deer comments are exactly right. We learn from our girls. In fact, two of them serve on our board as girl representatives and they teach us all the time. But maybe it's helpful if you just share a little bit of the context of what they're learning. Sure, and in order to do that, I have to give a nod to the staff here at the Alice Ball Institute, Program Director Alyssa Hunt and Program Coordinator Kane West, as well as volunteers and interns, work together in a really cohesive way to look at the current issues in feminism, in gender equality, in the things that are affecting the lives of women and girls in a really germane way, and to pull that into curriculum, that allows for the girls not just to hear presentations or be talked at because girls leadership council isn't a class it's not an in-school activity it's something that they do outside of school in order to develop their own voices so the girls talk about issues around um, identifying who you are as a person and what you relate to in terms of uh, the gender spectrum and the spectrum of sexuality learning who you are and in respecting who other people are, learning about issues like implicit bias and how the forces um, that we're not even aware of shape our perceptions of others and how we can get beyond that. Um, and then they'll talk about specific issues like the Equal Rights Amendment. They'll learn the history of the struggle for equal rights. So they'll talk about civil rights. They'll talk about the movement for LGBTQ equality and events like Stonewall. And they'll do that in a way that encourages critical thinking. So they'll consult firsthand resources, but also learn about how history is shaped by those who tell it, and that it's always important to question what we learn and to look deeper into stories so that we can also question what we see around us on a daily basis and think about what it means to us. That's great. So I want to I wanna just thank you for sharing that. I think what I wanted to do is kind of lay out for you what's happening in the background behind this search, because I think that will help to underscore why we felt it was so incredibly important to be very thoughtful about the needs analysis of what we actually needed in our next leader. And we took uh, half the time that was available to us to do that work before we ever listed the posting. So we didn't rush to get a posting out the door. Instead, we started by doing a survey and we put the survey out to our, our whole network. We promoted it on social media. We put it on the website. We sent it out an email. Um, and then we did these interviews and interviews included members of the Girls Leadership Council, alum of the Girls Leadership Council, parents of the girls, funders. Um, we spoke to donors. We spoke to the current staff. We spoke to former staff, including two former executive directors. Obviously, we spoke to the incumbent executive director. We spoke to members of the board, current and, and former. So we tried to really cast the net as broadly as possible to get all the perspectives out there. And that really gave us um, some clear direction of what were the key attributes that people really wanted to see in the next leader. And then we got to the board retreat and we hammered it out because one of the things that Shannon Sisler had said to me in no uncertain terms is, listen, take more time than you think you need before you even put the posting out the door to figure out what are the final two or three things that are going to make you say yes to a candidate or no to a candidate. She's like, if you don't do that work up front, I guarantee it's going to take you way longer to find your candidate and it's going to be way harder because you'll end up with nine top candidates instead of three. And she was right. So we challenged ourselves. We said, let's get, you know, let's hammer this out. What are the absolute must haves in our next candidate? And because we were having a board retreat anyway, we were able to devote a significant portion of that retreat to having this conversation. And Deirdre mentioned also the role of the governance committee. And that's not to be underestimated, by the way. They were extremely critical to this process because they own the structure for the board retreat and the agenda for the board retreat. And they also helped us figure out the job description. And so they were informing this process from the governance lens, just at the same 
same time that we were looking at it from the the search lens lens, and that was um, that was really I think extremely helpful. Deirdre, anything that I missed in that description that I should add? No, I, I think you covered it pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so I want to then just, um, we have a few minutes left and we have lots of questions. Thank you all for uh, putting the questions in there. I did see another question about the conversations that we had as a board with the previous executive director prior to her giving notice. Um, and what what had we already been thinking about with with succession planning? Deirdre, do you want to um, give, a, give a try at that one and then I can add some as well? Well, as I indicated, um, I didn't become board chair until just a few months um, before she had announced that um, she would be retiring. And I think we all knew at some point it was coming, but we did not realize it was going to be that soon. So in terms of succession planning, I really don't think we did anything in, in, in those terms. Um, I, I think that we always knew that when the time came, we were going to have to do a, a search. It wasn't as if we had someone within the organization who could take up the mantle um, of, um, you know, assume the role of the executive director. Now, I think that um, we learned from that. And I think in the future, um, we will um, do succession planning. Um, so that we're not in the same type of a, um, a situation. And what, what was telling to me, because um, I'm a very organized person, um, was that we did not even have information, detailed information about previous um, searches that had right. been done. It wasn't documented. Um, and we really had to rely on the executive director to tell us, well, what happened um, before, when before you became executive director, what happened? And what happened before that? Um, because she was even around before she was executive director. She had served as a volunteer and as a staff person for um, many, many years. So we really rely, had to rely very heavily. Nothing was written down. Um, we, it was just all memory. So I think we learned, um, you know, to, that we needed to document this process. So if we ever had to go through it again, um, we would not have to recreate the wheel. I could not agree with you more. <laughs> yeah, we documented everything. Yeah. So, um, and the nice thing is it's all organized in that workroom, which we can archive and it will stay there until unless and until we ever need it again. So that's that's extremely important. So we we were very, I think, very disciplined about that. Um, by the way, just to let everybody know, I mentioned we will be emailing out the white paper. Um, so that will be coming right after, you know, as part of the follow up after this webinar. Um, and you will see all the details of how we did this. But one of the things that was a question that just got asked that I don't know that we actually went into great detail about in the white paper is how we handled the reference checking. So Allison, I wondered if I could maybe ask you to share, because that was something that you connected with um, with Sonia about. So sort of tell us about that process from your perspective, and then we'll, we'll fill in a little bit from the other side. Sure, Sonia actually asked for any references fairly early in the process. I think a little bit earlier than I was used to in terms of an executive search, that's usually sort of the last thing. Uh, but I think given the virtual way in which everything was taking place, it was probably smart. It gave you more information as the hiring body. And it made me think about who would be a good reference, who could give Sonia and you the information you needed in terms of this search. It also gave her a little bit of time to prod me into admitting to my current board chair at the time that I was engaged in this search. So I ended up using my board chair and a really engaged volunteer slash former board member as references because of the way they could speak to the way that I act as an executive director, the way I lead an organization and work with a board. And I think under different circumstances, I might have tried to skirt that, but in the end, they understood why I was pursuing this position and why it was such a great fit for me. And from what I hear, they were very willing to um, tell you great things about me and tell you why they thought the position made sense for me and how sad they would be to lose me from that organization. 
<laughs> they gave us some great references, Allison. <laughs> um, so I'll just I'll just share from our perspective how we handled the reference checking. So as, as I mentioned, Sonia, we asked Sonia to handle that part for us, but it's probably helpful to know we started out with over a hundred applications. Um, Sonia had gone through the initial screenings and helped us get it down to the first 20 candidates that we wanted to review. Um, and of those first 20 candidates, I think we picked, I want to say maybe 11 people that we actually, no, sorry, nine people that we went on to do inter full interviews with. And then from that group, we got it down to three top candidates. And at that stage, that was when we then sort of shifted gears and um, wanted to have a series of engagements that the candidates would go through so we could they could continue to learn more about the organization and figure out if it was a fit for them, but we could also sort of see them in action with our core stakeholders, knowing that our stakeholders are very diverse in terms of age and race and gender, ethnicity. I mean, you name it, it's as diverse a group as, it, as you can get. And so we wanted to see how are they gonna do? Are they gonna be able to think on their feet? Are they gonna be able to lead a conversation just as comfortably with a group of you know, 12 to 16 year old girls as they are with you know, state funders? Um, how are they gonna be able to handle this wide range of individuals that they need to be confident having conversations with? And so when we got down to the final three that we're gonna go through that formal process, that was the point at which we asked Sonia, could you start doing the reference checking now? Because we wanted to be able to get um, a really clear picture of, of each candidate in time for the final board presentation. And by the time we got to the final board presentation, we'd actually narrowed the field even a little bit further down to two top candidates. And we presented two final candidates to the board. So both candidates um, gave a full presentation to the full board. And, it, and the night before that, the committee had met and sort of was ready to make a recommendation, but wanted to really hear the board and understand how the board was feeling. And what was really fascinating was the board was pretty unanimous in their consent uh, or in their um, consensus that the candidate that we were planning to recommend was the candidate that they wanted. So um, that made it easy. <laughs> that made it really easy. But the reference checking all kind of happened in that time frame, and then. You know, we were able to share a summary of the reference checking back with the board. Um, Georgia, would you maybe talk briefly about that final part of the process? You know, we, we had decided that we wanted to not just say, here's our candidate, take her or leave her to the board. We wanted the board to really be involved in the process, but the board had placed quite a lot of faith in our committee. I mean, we had done an incredible amount of work, but um, you know, if, if you're a board member, sometimes you're wondering like, well, what about other candidates? Or did you, you know, talk to this, that, or the other? And so how, how did you feel that went in terms of our ability to keep the board informed all throughout the process and be transparent so that they never really had to question whether we had, you know, done our homework? Yeah, at, at, at each board meeting that we had during the process, um, we gave a report about um, what we were doing and, um, you know, gave the opportunity for questions and if there were any concerns. Um, and we did the same with respect to the um, transition um, committee also. Um, and, and fortunately, they deferred a lot to um, both of these committees. They um, wanted to be kept informed about what was going on and they didn't um, want to interject themselves. Um, I was very um, um, committed to making sure that they were um, involved at the final stages because I did not want to have a situation where there wasn't buy-in. I just wanted to make sure that everybody um, had an opportunity to voice any opinions that they had about the final candidates, any concerns. So we did um, bring um, you know, all the information um, to the table for them to digest. Um, we gave um, all the information that we had about the final candidate, the um, board members had. And um, we, we did um, have a session one-on-one um, -on -one between the um, three final candidates and the board. Um, and in the end, when we had the um, time to um, discuss and um, debrief on um, what everybody's um, opinion was with respect to each individual, again, they really um, deferred um, to the committee um, as to, um, well, wh what is it that you recommend? Who, who's the person that you would um, select? And it was, again, I, I, I was very um, surprised that we had such consensus 
among um, the committee and the, and the board. But usually you don't experience that. No. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right. And I, and honestly, um, I remember that that feeling so well that um, I I really felt like it was kind of a slam dunk. I felt like you know what we we did we did this right because I've you know if there had been heated debate or uh, you know a complete lack of consensus or any contention, I would have felt um, we just didn't do enough. We didn't dig enough. We didn't, you know, do enough homework, but in actual fact, it was just, it was a very easy decision. I think for the board, they saw everything all along the way. We kept them very informed. They felt very engaged in the process. Um, by the time we got to the final vote, it was, it was pretty easy, which was really great. Um, there is one other question that, that someone asked, that I feel like we should address, which is how did you deal with internal people who made it known they would like to apply for the position? And, yeah. um, Deirdre, do you want to tackle that one? Cause we, you know, we had we sure. had that situation. Sure, we did have that situation. We did have one person um, apply, and we had decided early on um, that it's out of courtesy um, if we had um, a member of the staff apply that we would um, give them an interview. Um, and I think it was pretty much whether we thought they were qualified or not. We just thought that because they were a staff member that um, it, it would be the appropriate thing to do. Fortunately, you know, this person um, did have, um, you know, qualifications and, and they were among um, our final candidates that we chose. So it wasn't a stretch. It wasn't like we were just interviewing um, her um, just for the heck of it, you know, um, she, she did um, meet, the re meet the requirements. Um, she did not turn out to be among our final three um, but it, it went very well. We treated her the same as we did any other um, candidate. Um, fortunately, because of the character of the, of, of the person she is, she told us up front that um, if she um, was not the successful candidate, there wouldn't be any hard feeling and that she had every intention of continuing to remain an employee of the organization. So. Um, I think the key is that you, you, you be courteous to the existing um, employee, you know, the current employee, but um, at the same time, you um, make sure that you're treating everybody the same. So it's a fair and equitable process. Yeah, I think I think you've described it very well. The only thing I would maybe add was the staff was very involved. Um, they were involved in the board retreat and they were involved in the needs assessment process and really had, I think, a very clear understanding of the kind of candidate we were looking for. And so when it came time for me to have the conversation um, with the staff member that that she was not going to be selected to go on to the to final round, it was a very honestly, it was a very pleasant and very easy conversation. She almost kind of took herself out of the running and said, look, I know, I know what you're looking for. And I, I said from the beginning, you know, this would not in any way color my feeling about the organization or make me want to leave or anything like that. Um, and she, and she, almost, she almost sounded kind of relieved <laughs> when I spoke with her about it. And, um, you know, and, and so it was, and so it was good. I mean, thankfully she's a consummate professional. The situation was, was good. I can certainly know there are other times where it doesn't go that well um, and it doesn't go that smoothly and it can get awkward. And so to Deirdre's point, I think having that as part of your process up front, what will we do if, and when, um, and really talking that through before you announce the role is important. You know, just assume that it might happen and be ready for it so that you know exactly how you're going to handle it. And then the most important thing is that person should not really be treated differently from any other candidate with the exception of, as Deidre pointed out, we would, we would, we had agreed we would interview anyone from the staff who would put their name forward because we felt as a courtesy, that would be the fair thing to do. And so we, we did that. Um, well, we are, believe it or not, we're at the end of our time. So I'm going to do a quick lightning round um, before we end our session today, which, by the way, thank you all for your great questions. These are really terrific questions. So quick lightning round before we go. I wanted to share just a few of the, the lessons learned that I felt I took away from this um, experience, which are up here on the screen, so I won't read them to you. Allison, what are some um, takeaways for you from this experience being our new executive director? I just want to highlight how this process helped me to build relationships within this organization from the very beginning. I still have not met many of the board members in person four months after starting the job, 
But because I got to know them through this search process first and then through the work here, there hasn't been any issue in feeling connected to the organization and to the people who work with it. So I think that was a great outcome from this work. That's terrific. Deirdre, how about you? Best and final lessons learned. Yeah, I, this was the first time I had been involved in a process like this where the stakeholders were um, so engaged. And I, I think that is very important, especially for a um, nonprofit that has um, a very targeted constituency um, to make sure that um, the perspectives of those stakeholders and, and their opinions are um, you know, included in the process and, and respect it. Um, and it also um, lends itself to transparency. I just think that that's very important. Um, the transparency that we engage in, not just with our committee and with our board, but with our stakeholders, whether it was donors or um, the staff or the parents and um, the girl leadership um, members. Um, we, we have very open communication and, and transparency. Well, thank you so much. I, I hope you'll all sort of virtually join me in congratulating and welcoming and thank you, thanking Deirdre Webster Cobb, uh, the board chair of Alice Paul Institute and Allison Titman, executive director of, of Alice Paul Institute. Thank you both so much for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. And um, thank all of you. You asked such great questions. I hope that if we didn't have a chance to really address your question in detail, the white paper will help. And then by all means, feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to hear from you. So thank you all so much. and. Uh, uh, thank you again.